Welcome to the Complete Story Series, where we take trade paperbacks and single issues and we break them down into digestible bites. Then we read it dramatically back to you. All changes to the text panels and images are done to prevent copyright issues and all art is owned by the respected companies. Now I would like to take a moment to let you, the viewer, know that this story has a lot of different spider people in it. While I will attempt to briefly explain some of them, we already have a Spider-Verse playlist where you can get some more basic knowledge on some of the key characters. There you'll find the story of Mayday Parker, Spider-Man Noir, Spider, Spider-Gwen, Superior Spider-Man, and Silk, along with the origins of Jessica Drew and Miles Morales. I highly recommend you watch those before you continue with this video, but if you aren't interested in all of them, let's go. Little known fact guys, the Superior Spider-Man video that we did where we explained all 31 issues of the series was one of the first videos that helped us grow this channel. If you're curious to see how far we've come, click now to see that story. But the story of Superior Spider-Man is that Otto Octavius, otherwise known as Dr. Octopus, has taken over Spider-Man's body. But the story doesn't end there. Now in the middle of that story arc, the Spider-Man from 2099, Miguel O'Hara, arrived in our present day to stop a time-traveling problem, and the superior Spider-Man seemingly sacrificed himself to stop the impending time explosion, and he vanished in a blink of an eye. Now the story of Superior Spider-Man continues from that point as he returns back to the present day one day later. But what happened during that one day? Well, he was sent to the year 2099, Superior Spider-Man spent a lot of time gathering up tools, parts, and technology to build himself a time travel device. This is the Superior Spider-Man after all. He isn't going to stay stuck here in this random time period. But not only did he invent a time travel device, he also revived the love of his life, Anne Marie, by creating a holographic companion to join him. Even evil villains who take over superheroes' bodies need a little love in their lives, don't they? So Superior Spider-Man finishes working on his time travel device, and he prepares to head home finally. But when he arrives home, something's wrong. He isn't actually home, and this isn't even actually his time. Looking around, he sees a slain Spider-Man just laying down in front of him. And once he turns him over, he discovers that this Spider-Man is a part of the Fantastic Five. But something is wrong. How did this Spider-Man die? So, Superior Spider-Man figures out how he slipped dimensions, and he travels between them. And over, and over, and over, he sees dead Spider-Man. So, after some further analysis, Superior Spider-Man figures out the killer's energy signature, and he figures out how he can track him. So, he portal hops right to our mysterious villain, just in time to save the Spider-Man of India. Superior Spider-Man and Spider-Man of India ride the dimensional portals back to his headquarters, where Superior Spider-Man begins building his army against this unknown threat. Eventually, Superior Spider-Man gets enough Spider-Man together and they launch a full-scale assault against this mysterious foe. Everything seems to be going just as Otto, the Superior Spider-Man, planned. They're winning and they're defeating this foe, but the trap doesn't work. Eventually, his own reinforcements arrive, referring to him as Karn. And the Spider-Man army has to retreat quickly as they're taking injuries and they go back to the year 2099, where Otto storms off, demanding that no one disturb him. He will solve this problem, even if he has to kill this enemy. But we'll come back to Superior Spider-Man's army shortly. Let us travel to the universe known as 616. That would be our main universe, where most of the main storylines take place. Peter Parker has crashed from a long night of web-slinging, only to be awoken by Silk deciding to drop by. Literally. Now listeners, we're about to meet a lot of spider people who make up this storyline. And while we've created a series of videos to help you get caught up, I'm going to explain each one of them as we come across them. Now this is the Spider-Man that you all know and love, and we will be referring to him as Peter Parker for the remainder of this story. The woman hanging upside down is Cindy Moon, and we discovered during the original Sin event that Cindy was bitten by the same radioactive spider as Peter, and due to this they have a very strong sexual connection. They are starting to have a very strong relationship, but it's not quite there yet. So Peter and Silk go on patrol, and they end up taking down a giant robot, which is trying to rob a bank when something interesting happens. Jessica Drew, whom is Spider-Woman and also an Avenger, along with Anya Corazon, also known as Spider-Girl, show up. And just when Peter is starting to think of this as a spider convention, the Spider-Man of 2099 comes swinging in. Now he's also known as Miguel O'Hare, and he's currently stuck in our time due to everything going on with Superior Spider-Man. But don't worry, these three spider people are friends of Peter. But the spider people don't stop with his friends. No, Billy Braddock, also known as Spider UK and a member of the Captain Britain Corps, drops in. Then Mayday Parker, Peter's daughter from an alternate dimension shows up. And the cream of the crop, Spider-Ham. 
spectacular Peter Porker of Earth-25. Okay, whoa, Peter yells as he stops everyone. What is this, future me, British me, and is that cartoon pig me? And Peter Porker just replies with, yeah, so what do you want to make about it? Peter, still in the shock, replies, I don't know, a luau? Anyone care to explain? So Mayday Parker comes over and removes her mask to show that she is her, that Peter Parker does know her because they've met before. So trust her, please. The group explains that they are all from different dimensions and an enemy known as Morlun is traveling between the universes, killing off the Spider-Man of the multiverse. They're all here because they need Peter's help and he is the only Spider-Man who has defeated Morlun multiple times. This is the only Earth that Morlun and his family known as the Inheritors are afraid of, or at least they were. They're on their way here right now. Well, Peter realizes how bad this could be if Morlun arrives again, so he shuffles everyone into the portal and the Peter Parker Spider Army begins. Meanwhile, elsewhere on Earth 616, Morlon's brother is already here, and he's destroying the new warriors while he's trying to feast on Kane. Now, Kane is the clone of Peter Parker from the main universe, who has gone off on his own trials and tribulations to earn the name of Scarlet Spider. He isn't as happy go lucky as Peter, as he's had a much harsher life, and now it appears that he's about to be eaten. But this is Kane, and he's not about to go down without a fight, as he grows spines out of his arms and he stabs the inheritor in the chest. The Inheritor just laughs, so you are the other. As he goes in for the final bite that's going to end Kane's life. And then, in jumps more Spider-Man. Bruce Banner from a world where he got spider powers instead of becoming the Hulk. An old man spider from another world where Peter didn't become a hero. They quickly jump on the Inheritor, distracting him, while Gwen freaking Stacy as Spider-Girl picks up Kane. And it's just as much of a shock to him as it is to us. But before Kane can freak out about Gwen Stacy and assume that it's all another trick from the Jackal, Ben Riley pops in and he explains that they're going to explain everything when they get him to safety. Ben Riley is the other clone, and this version is from a world where he didn't die at the end of the clone story arc. Old Man Spider, Spider Gwen, and Ben Riley all head out of the portal as they watch the Inheritor tear Bruce Banner apart and sacrifice himself so that they can all get away. You had better be worth it, Kane, Old Man Spider says as they leave. All of the spider people converge on the spider refuge, a world where Spider-Man stayed as Captain Universe and therefore has all of the powers of the universe at his disposal. In this world, he can manipulate the very fabric of time and space, and the Inheritors dare not venture here. They count their numbers as 20 strong, and they tell Peter, we need you, you're the strongest one out of all of us. Meanwhile, over in the Ultimate Universe, Miles and this version of Jessica Drew are standing in front of the graveyard visiting the Ultimate Peter Parker's gravesite, when the Inheritors decide to pop in and say hello. But before anyone can even fight, Superior Spider-Man and Spider-Punk both arrive to collect the two younger of the spider totems. Back with Peter Parker, Old Man Spider explains that there is a second group, and it's time for both Spider-Man groups to meet up and combine forces. So they all jump through the portal and into Superior Spider-Man's base of operations with his Spider-Man army. Spider-Man Noir looks at them and he calls out for Superior, Hey, we've got company! And Spider-Monkey looks at Spider-Ham and he yells out, Oh my god, a talking pig! And Spider-Ham just looks at him and says, You're kidding, right? Superior Spider-Man walks out and declares, You idiots! Which of course surprises the entire group. I've been working on a device to help cloak our unique energy signatures that are traveling across the universe, allowing us to hide from the Inheritors, but it only works up to a certain point, and you brought both of the largest signatures to our doorstep. Kane here is a unique signature and is called the Other, and Silk is another unique signature called the Bride. But while Superior Spider-Man is ranting about how this other group screwed everything up, Peter Parker realizes that this is Dr. Octopus. This isn't another Peter Parker. This is happening during the period in which Superior Spider-Man is lost in time. And almost as if on cue, one of the Inheritors comes jumping through a portal. Superior Spider-Man braces himself and he tells everyone, Do not panic! I'm here now! Everyone attack like I've trained you! Everyone jumps in with Ashley Barton, Spider-Girl, Spider-Monkey, and Six-Armed Spider-Man taking point. But the Inheritor just laughs as he punches a hole right through Cyborg Spider-Man, taking him out of the fight. So Spider-Girl, Mayday, Parker, and Kane jump in to continue the assault. But Peter Parker sees the problem. This plan is going to fail. It can't continue. And just as he thinks that, Kane uses the power of the other to spear and kill the Inheritor. Everyone stands there in shock, but within minutes, another version of the same Inheritor, and now his siblings arrive. 
The fight isn't over yet. Kane turns to Ben Riley and he says, Riley, you thinking what I'm thinking? And Ben says, clone, gotta be. Let's get to their location. So they open a portal back to wherever the clone came from. And then Ultimate Jessica Drew, the female clone of the Ultimate Peter Parker, joins them as the clones go on their own adventure. But we'll come back to the clone adventure eventually. Peter Parker realizes that they're losing Spider-Man left and right, and he starts to order everyone to escape out of here. But Silk realizes that the Inheritors are following her energy signature. So she runs past Peter, grabbing one of the fallen Spider-Man's teleporters. Sorry, Peter, but I have to make this right. I'll lead them away. And boom, she's gone. But not before Jessica Drew and Spider-Man Noir follow after her. The rest of the Spider-Army travels back to the world where Spider-Man has kept his powers of Captain Universe. They've gone back to the only safe zone they have, the Spider-Refuge. So there's a bunch of stuff going on, and we're about to go mock speed to get to the good parts again. But basically, we have Silk, Spider-Woman, and Spider-Man Noir on one adventure. We have Kane, Ben Riley, and Ultimate Jessica Drew, whom we will now call Jess from this point, on a different adventure. And we have everyone else retreating back to the safe zone. Back in the safe zone, Peter Parker tells Superior Spider-Man, that he's in charge now. He's the only one who has defeated an inheritor, and the superior Spider-Man plan isn't going to work. Thus, the two men fight it out, and Peter Parker eventually wins because Superior assumes that he would never lose to Peter Parker again. So this Peter Parker must be from his own past, and if Superior Spider-Man hurts him, he could damage his own future. So he backs off for now and lets Peter Parker take over. Meanwhile, Spider-Woman, Silk, and Spider-Man Noir are riding on top of giant lizard donkeys. They're traveling between all of the worlds trying to avoid the Inheritors, who are hot on their trails. Their adventure takes them all over, and eventually, Spider-Man Noir gets injured and needs to be brought back to the home world of Noir. And this adventure turns into Spider-Woman, Silk, and Noir Felicia Hardy fighting against various enemies and gangs trying to get Spider-Man Noir to safety. Eventually, Spider-Woman calls up Peter Parker asking for more help, because, as she puts it, Silk is acting like a child and just running around to all of these universes. I need help, Peter. So Peter sends in Anya and Spider-Gwen to assist, but not before having a little heart-to-heart -heart talk with Spider-Gwen. On Spider-Gwen's world, Peter Parker is the one that they lost, while on the 616 Peter Parker's world, it was Gwen Stacy who died. So they both agree to watch out for each other, and they move forward. Once Peter gets to Jessica, they talk it out, and Peter tells her that they have a much bigger plan for her. But she argues, how could you plan to leave Silk with a couple of teenage bodyguards? So Peter tells her that they don't have a choice. The mission that he has for her is much larger than guarding Silk, and he trusts Anya and Spider-Gwen. So Jessica has a heart-to-heart -heart with both of the ladies, and she tells them to watch Silk carefully, and don't let her get into trouble. They both agree, and Peter and Jessica leave the noir world, and then Anya and Spider-Gwen realize They've already lost track of Silk. Oh crap. Silk has decided to run off on her own because she overheard Peter and Jessica calling her a child, and she figures she'll show them. She'll hide all by herself. While this is going on, Miles Morales is on a separate mission with the Ultimate Spider-Man from the TV show that's on Disney right now to find more Spider-Man, and they currently are swinging through the 1960s television show Spider-Man World. They're trying to build up as many reinforcements as possible as per Peter Parker's orders. It wouldn't be so weird, except that the Disney TV show Spider-Man keeps having these weird daydreaming moments where he breaks the fourth wall. Meanwhile, at the spider save zone, while our main Peter Parker is away, one inheritor to rule them all arrives in the save zone. Solus, the father of the inheritors. Captain Universe Spider-Man laughs. You dare come to my world? I have the power of the universe itself in this world. And while I can't leave this world to battle you elsewhere, I have all of the power in the world here. But Solus just laughs at him. You may be all-powerful, but I have inherited the multiverse. And he slams Captain Universe Spider-Man into the ground. He then steps over, and he sucks the life force of the universe right out of him. As he fades away, saying, No, I had ultimate power and ultimate responsibility. Just then, another Inheritor walks over and knocks Mayday Parker on her butt and takes the baby that she has with her. You see, the baby that's with her is her younger brother, Benji, and the only other survivor of her family. If you want to get the full story of her escape with her baby brother, make sure you check out our Mayday Parker video. Anyway, the Inheritor comes over and takes the baby with Mayday screaming, No! You leave my brother alone! But she can do nothing to stop him, as he grabs the baby by the leg and he declares, Father, I have the Scion! You see, I think it's time for you to learn what the Inheritors are doing. The Inheritors are looking for the Other, the Bride, and the Scion for a ritual, a very evil ritual. This ritual will stop the Spider Totems from ever being born again. And if it does that, we'll never have another Spider-Man in the entire multiverse ever again. 
Mordlun takes the child, then he backs in Mayday Parker again, and he leaves this place for good. While she's screaming out, No! But Morlun taking the child is the least of our worries, as Solus just cuts down as many of these Spider-Men as possible. He's killing them left and right. But just then, the main Peter Parker returns with their savior. The Japanese Spider-Man jumping through the portal with their giant Japanese Spider-Man robot, Lepharden. But Solus just starts to tear apart the giant robot, calling it simply a toy. The entire Spider-Man army realizes that this is a losing battle, and they quickly jump worlds to get away. And while Peter Parker is panicking, trying to figure out what they need to do next, Jessica Drew dials back in, and informs Peter that she's currently on Loom World, the home world of the Inheritors, and she has the perfect disguise. You see, the Jessica Drew of this world is one of Morlon's maids, almost as if it was planned out by something like the Master Weaver. You see, the Master Weaver is the one being that controls the fates of everyone. And right now, he's the prisoner of the Inheritors. Peter realizes that her being the maid has to mean more than it actually appears, but he decides to check in on Ultimate Spider-Man and Miles Morales to see how the recruitment is going. They are apparently on a world with a Chibi Spider-Man, a Cowboy Spider-Man, a Catchphrase Spider-Man, and a Talking Car Spider-Man being chased by the police. Miles replies with, Recruitment is going fine, but this is the moment where my life jumped the shark. And Peter tells them just to keep at it, while Ultimate Spider-Man yells out, Web Warriors, away! And Miles just shakes his head. I never agreed to call us that. Peter then checks in with Spider-Man 2099, and him and Lady Spider are dissecting an inheritor in the future so they're gonna be a while. But before they can share any more information, Genix, one of the Inheritors, taps in. We've been listening to everything you're saying, and now it's time for that to stop. This little Spider-Man army stops today. And just then, the Inheritors arrive on the new world that the Spider-Men are on. The fight rages on once again, but just then, Jessica Drew teleports in a gift from the Master Weaver, the prophecy scrolls that explain everything that's going on. Who the Bride, the Other, and the Scion are, and the future of the Inheritors, and why they're stopping everything. It's all right here. And then, Silk calls up Peter Parker and tells him, Bring everyone to my location. I have found us a new safe zone. The entire Spider Army jumps into World 3145, and immediately the Inheritors stop and refuse to follow. But all of the Spider-Men also get sick right away. This world is irradiated and destroyed. But Silk calls up and tells them to come to a very specific location. And once they all get there, they find a bunker that will protect them from the radiation, along with this world's spider totem, Uncle Ben. For those of you who don't know Spider-Man that well, this is the man that coined the phrase, with great power comes great responsibility. And he died giving Peter Parker the drive and the purpose to become Spider-Man. On this world, it was Uncle Ben who was bitten, and the Green Goblin blew up his home with his wife and his nephew, Peter. So he quit being a superhero, and he forfeited his powers. And while he wasn't being a superhero and hiding in this bunker, Dr. Octopus blew the world up, killing everyone except for Uncle Ben. While he's explaining this to the group, Silk and Spider-Gwen decide that they're going to go to Loom World and rescue Jessica Drew. So poof, they both vanish. While Anya, one of the Spider-Girls of the main universe, sits down and reads the prophecy that Jessica Drew provided to them. The entire Spider army finally learns why the Inheritors are hunting them down. The purpose is to stop the Spider-Men from ever being born again, because the prophecy states that eventually, the Spider-Men will rise and defeat the Inheritors. So, Peter realizes that all of this is an easy fix. If the Inheritors just need the Scion, the Bride, and the other, he'll just keep Silk and Kane from even going to Loom World. But when he calls them both up to tell them not to go there, he discovers that Silk just went to Loom World to save Jessica Drew, and Kane went there for revenge. But revenge for what? While we get to that, Peter Parker and Uncle Ben will try to calm down Mayday Parker because she's freaking out right now that Benji, her little brother, is the Scion, and the Inheritors are apparently about to sacrifice her only living family member. So what happened to the clones this entire time? Well, as with most of this story, it's yet another massive tale, so we're gonna have to move through it quickly. Now the clones are Kane, Ben Riley, and Jess, and they've got it all figured out as to where the Inheritors are coming back from, because it's a cloning technology and they used their technology to trace the original portal back to the world where the clones are made. And when they enter that world, they discover a world full of clones. Clones everywhere, and the entire world is run by Genix, one of the Inheritors. So they sneak by an evil Tony Stark, and they go as deep as they can into this world until they eventually arrive at an entire facility filled with Inheritor clones. 
Jess takes off because she's questioning their purpose. She doesn't understand Kane and his rage, and she doesn't understand Ben Riley's just goofy nature. So she decides to climb to the top of the facility where she's going to disconnect the transmitter that the inheritors use to tell their clone to wake up because their main body died. Well, while they're doing this, Ben Riley and Kane discover all of the other clones. And by other clones, I mean Genix's ultimate plan. You see, he was trying to clone the Spider Totem. He's trying to make an endless supply of Spider Totems for his family to feast on so they don't have to go hunting. Well, as they discover all of these Spider Totem clones, Genix arrives to fight it out with them, and Kane begins to lose control. You see, Kane is the other, a being filled with the powers of a spider god, and the angrier he gets, the more he begins to change. Spikes and talons begin to form out of his body, and he begins to beat senselessly on Genix, until he eventually kills him. Ben Riley stands there in shock, and Kane tries to get a grip on himself. But none of this matters because a new Genix awakens right there, and he stands up, ready to fight again. And so while their fight continues, Jess tries to get to the top of the building where she's going to turn off the transmitter. But Johnny Storm shows up. You see, this is an evil Johnny Storm who works for Genix. So she begins to battle with him, and she crawls along the top of the building, fighting it out to the best of her ability. Back on the battle down below, Kane begins to lose his steam, and he begins to wear himself out because every time that they tear down Argenix, another one gets up. And Ben Riley ends up getting sidelined by a dislocated shoulder. Ben realizes that there's only one resolution for this, and as Jess ends her battle with Johnny Storm and she joins the battle against Genix with Kane, Ben begins to go back to the roof, and he grabs every single one of the explosives that are up there. All three of the clones were supposed to go home. All three were supposed to return to their worlds. But Ben Riley, Ben Riley is just always destined to die, isn't he? So he tells Kane and Jess to get away from the building, escape while they can, because at least two of them have to survive. And as Jess drags the injured Kane out of the building, Ben throws the explosives at the tower, taking the entire tower out of the equation. And as it explodes around him, and as he begins to die, he thinks to himself, maybe I can make it out of this one too. Kane looks up furious. Ben Riley had to die again? And he tells Jess, stay here. He has a monster inside of himself that the inheritors are scared of, and he's gonna bring it to him. So he strands her in this world as he leaves through a portal into Loom World, prepared to end this himself. We now go back to Peter Parker calling into Kane and Kane responding in a very angry tone that he's already in Loom World to end this. It was time to stop running, because they can't clone themselves anymore. So Kane lets it all go. He lets the other take control, and the powers of a spider god begin to course through his veins, and he changes into a monstrous, hulking spider beast. The inheritors arrive to the pulse of the other awakening on their own world, and they stand there in awe at his power at first. And then Kane begins to wreck them, throwing them around like flies and growling at them until he gets an open shot at Solus, the father of the Inheritors himself. And he impales him with his spikes on his arms, killing Solus. And Solus doesn't have a clone anymore to revive himself with. But this just pisses off Morlun as he jumps onto Kane and tears off one of his own spider talons and shoves it through the back of Kane's head, killing him right there. Kane falls to the ground and the Inheritors drag his body off to their home to get ready for their ritual. Meanwhile, back with Peter Parker, he realizes that they need to move again. They've convinced Uncle Ben to get ready for the fight, and Mayday has calmed down enough that all of them are ready to go to Loom World. He calls into Miles and the Ultimate TV Peter Parker, and he tells them, Get to Loom World now! We're ending this. And Miles tells Peter that the Web Warriors will swing by and pick up Jess, and then get there. And Ultimate TV Spider-Man is just so happy that Miles finally said it. He called them the Web Warriors! Superior Spider-Man and Peter Parker prep the portal, and Superior yells out, The die is cast! But Peter stops him. Hey, I'm the one running the show. I get the big line. Spider-Friends, go for it! And Spider-Ham just says, Nailed it! Silk, Spider-Gwen, and Jessica Drew all get back with the team, and Ultimate Jess jumps in at first, yelling, We're not losing one more man today! And Spider-Ham says, OR WOMAN! And Jess says, OR WOMAN! And Spider-Ham says, OR PIG! And Jess says, SHUT UP! Alright, whatever listeners, you stayed on this long, I owe you a resolution. The battle rages on with the Spider-Men teaming up against the Inheritors, and the Inheritors don't have extra clone bodies, so there's no more dying and coming back. 
The Spider-Man would probably not have won, except that they have one Inheritor on their side. You see, there's an exiled brother of the Inheritors that joined up because he didn't believe in killing off the Spider-Man, and he was promised that if he helped them win, they could find him an alternate food source, so he agreed to join them. This Inheritor is Karn, the Inheritor that Superior first met at the beginning of our story, and I'm sorry that we don't have time to go into that extra story, but we're already way over our time limit here. They fight and they fight until Morlun realizes that the Inheritors may lose. So he runs to the baby that's suspended in the Master Weaver web. The baby that once killed will end all of the spider totems forever. And he gets ready to kill him finally. Only to be kicked by a hoof in the face. You see, while Morlun was fighting, Peter Parker swapped the baby with Spider-Ham. At the start of this battle, Uncle Ben took Benji and he returned back to their original world. Morlun is furious! How could their plan be unraveling? Everything was going so perfectly for the Inheritors. And Peter tells him that this is all a part of his plan. You're done, Morlun. And he yells into the communicator, Spider-Man 2099, do it now. And just then, Spider-Man 2099 comes riding in on a repaired Leopardon, the giant Japanese robot Spider-Man. The fight rages on with the Inheritors obviously losing until eventually Superior Spider-Man decides to enact his own plans. And he jumps over everyone and kills the Master Weaver. Everyone stands there. The Weaver of life itself, of existence, has been murdered in this fight. Morlun begins to fill to the brim with rage and he jumps on Peter Parker. If he's going to lose, he's going to at least finally get his revenge on the 616 Peter Parker. So Peter Parker opens one final portal, and he warps himself and Morlun into the radioactive world, the one world that the Inheritors can't survive on. Peter's ready to die there, let the radiation just overwhelm him. But Silk has his back, and she throws down a lifeline and brings him back to Loom World. And that's it. Karn throws each of his family members into the radioactive world. Without clones or a way to travel the multiverse, they'll be stuck in that world without power. And Peter just sits there in Silk's arms. His life force is drained away, weakening him, but he'll survive. After a brief time of relaxing, the Spider Army parts ways back to their home worlds. First up is Mayday Parker, who returns to her world where she lost her father, mother, and boyfriend. And when she gets there, she's in shock because her boyfriend survived, and he pulled Mary Jane out of the fire. Both of them lived, and Uncle Ben decided to stay there to do something that an Uncle Ben has never gotten to do become a grandfather to Mayday Parker and Benji. Mayday is sad to see that her father didn't survive the battle with the Inheritors, but Mary Jane gives her the Spider-Man suit and asks her to carry on the title, become what her father wanted, become Spider-Woman. Miles and Ultimate Jess bid their farewells with Miles wishing that the adventure had lasted longer, like their last one, which was so cool. And after a bit of struggling, Superior Spider-Man is sent back to his time and place, and since it involves a bit of time travel, he'll forget everything that ever happened. Karn then takes over as the Master Weaver, and the Spider-Man of the Captain Britain Corps and Anya stay at the Web of Fate to become the new Web Warriors. So, the rest of the 616 Spider-Men and Spider-Women all head home. Home to relax, and finally, not have to deal with all this crazy multiverse Spider-Verse stuff. That's it folks, the Spider-Verse has been crammed into as much of a tight space as we can. Like I've always told you guys, the stories are as long as we need them to be to tell the story properly, but I definitely recommend reading this one yourself. There's just so much that we had to skip over. As usual, if you want to chat with me about this video, follow us on Twitter at ComicStorian, and don't forget, we have a video game channel called Eligible Monster, where we give you video game variety videos every week. And don't forget about our website, theweeklypool.net. I really have nothing else to say here. Thank you guys for staying to the very end. If you did, I really do appreciate it, and I'll see you guys next time right here. Lepardon! Lepardon! Le uh, Lepardon! But Solus just starts to tear apart Lepardon. Lepardon? Lepardon. Le pardon? <laughs> God damn.